But have you ever found yourself, have you ever been in a situation where you are literally praying for your life? Now, I'm relatively young, and I've only had a couple of opportunities in my life where I, I literally was praying for my life. I mean, maybe, maybe for you it was a health concern. Maybe it was an accident had happened. Or how about a tornado? I mean, we live in the Midwest. I used to live in South Dakota where it was more frequent. You'd pray when tornadoes were coming, right? Or, or if you lived in the South, hurricanes, or we, we could pray for blizzards. I mean, boy, some of those blizzards, you ever been, I've been caught in a car at times where I realized I shouldn't be out driving. You know, this was a foolish choice. So you find yourself praying, right? And, and, and I even found myself occasionally praying. That one of the times that sticks out most in my memory uh, that I prayed in a moment of crisis, comes from before even I was a Christian. Yet I knew even in those moments that I should pray. And it's funny how when things get tough and get scary, even those who don't believe often turn to prayer. We're going to be looking at Psalm 27 today. And in Psalm 27, we find David praying for his life. Most scholars believe that this came at a time in David's life where where King Saul was literally hunting him and trying to kill him. Saul and his soldiers intended to kill David. David was literally on the run for his very life. He was being pursued by enemies. He was being shut out from the house of the Lord, away from the people of God, separated from his family, from his friends, and he was being slandered by false witnesses. It was clearly an incredible time of of crisis and stress. And so we find David literally praying for his life. So where do you go when life hits you with a crisis? Where do you turn to when the going gets tough? Do you indeed turn to God? Do you pray in those situations? I hope so. But more importantly, then, how, how do you pray during a crisis? Many people are not prepared to pray in a crisis, especially if that is the only time that they ever pray. Their prayers turn out to be more cries of panic than anything else. Very different than the attitude that David models for us in his prayer here in Psalm 27. As we look at this psalm today, you're going to see, we we find a a prayer of David, this prayer of absolute trust and confidence in the midst of the trials he's going through. So if you want to follow along, Psalm 27, there are some Bibles underneath the chairs. You can use electronic Bible, iPad, iTunes, whatever you got, lift it, take it out, and we'll use it. Um, But we're going to look at Psalm 27 pretty much exclusively today, and I'm going to walk our way through it. And let's look at Psalm 27 together and see and what we can learn from David and how that can apply to our own lives and our own prayer lives. In Psalm 27, verse 1, David begins by saying, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Notice he claims God as his very own. He has this, this personal relationship with God. God is my light. God is my salvation. Is God your light and your salvation? Do you know God in this same intimate way that David did? Do you know the God that is the God of light? Light which dispels darkness. Have you ever been in a cave before? Like deep underground cave where they shut off all the lights on you? I've been in a number of caves. One of the caves, the uh, most recent cave I was in, is the one in Branson, Missouri. It's an uh, uh, interesting little cave. Not a long cave, but a, a lot of up and down in that cave. And they take you to the very bottom of this cave. You're, I don't know, hundreds of feet underground. And then they say, we're going to turn off the lights. And they do. And it's absolute pitch black darkness. There's no source of light. And then they light one candle. One little, measly, meager, tiny candle. You would be amazed 
at how much light a single candle can provide. You begin to see all over again inside this very large cavern that you're in. Light dispels darkness. And as we read the Bible, light can stand for life, for God's blessing or God's favor. And if you dig through the Hebrew here in Psalm 27, the very word that is used for the word salvation is the word Yeshua. If you're not unfamiliar with that word, it's the same word for Jesus in the New Testament. It's a word that speaks of God's ability to save and deliver us from times of harm. And so David says, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? If you were in the middle of a tornado, I've been there. Had a tornado go right over my head once. you ever been in the middle of a tornado... If you found yourself in the middle of one of those, or maybe you were in like a trailer home and said, I was out in the woods and it went right over my head. But maybe you're a trailer home, right? You might worry. Or if you were in the woods, I worried. I had nothing but trees to hide under. And it was lightning out too. So trees were a bad idea. But there was a tornado so, and it was hailing. So what do you do? You got to kind of pick and choose what you do. And you worry. But if you were in an underground concrete bunker of some sort, right? You wouldn't have anything to worry about. When I was a kid, we used to go and climb under the stairs of the house, right? You remember that? Because the stairs are one of the strongest parts of your home, if you don't know that. That's why they tell you to go underneath the stairs. If you've got stairs in a basement area, if the whole house collapses, that stair may keep the roof off you, may keep the weight of the building off you, may keep you protected. The basement keeps you safe from the tornado, the stairs keep you safe from the house. Right? So you want to be in a place of strong protection. And when God is the strength of your life, when the Lord Almighty is your stronghold like it was for David, when you are in this strong place of protection, then you can say things like, if God is for us, who then could be against us, right? You see, David was not afraid because he was with God and God was a strong place of protection for him as Saul and his soldiers were trying to kill him. So what is the strength in your life? What supports you? What what holds you? What upholds you? What sustains you through the daily struggles of life? Because we all have them. What do you look for? What do you look to to give you strength? David's first secret in praying in a crisis was that God was personal to him. He was David's light and salvation, the stronghold of his life. In times of trial, in times of crisis and temptation, remember, the Lord is your strength. Now as we look at Psalm 27, another reason that David had confidence in his prayer was he knew that there was an inevitable outcome for his enemies. Look at verse 2. David says, When evildoers assail me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and my foes, it is they who will stumble and fall. David describes his enemies in pretty graphic terms here, right? They're they're evil men. They're advancing against him. They're ready to devour his flesh. He pictures them as if they were wild animals, right? With no compassion and no mercy, just coming to get him. But when they attack, when they come after him, David says, it is they who will stumble and fall. I mean, it's one thing if your enemy stumbles but gets back up again and keeps coming, right? But David says, no, they're going to stumble and fall. They will not succeed in their efforts against him. And the word there, they, the they is is, is emphatic in the Hebrew. When they attack me, they will stumble and fall. Not me, they. Whatever they bring against me, whatever rock they roll against me, whatever pit they dig against me, whatever, whatever they bring... Instead, they're going to be trapped. Instead, they're going to be crushed. Instead, they're going to stumble and fall. Why? 
because they're evil men. They are not on God's side, and therefore God is not on their side either. You see, it's not necessarily a bad thing when evil men oppose you. Now, if if godly people stand against you, that's a different matter. Many of you know John Wesley, and John Wesley once prayed, Lord, if I must contend, let it not be with thy people. But we shouldn't be surprised if the world hates us. If the world comes against believers. Jesus said, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first, right? John 15, 18. Evil men hated Jesus because they hated God. Evil men hate Christians because they hate Jesus. And this goes all the way back. Way back to the beginning of the Bible. Way, way back into the garden, right? Where God said that there would be enmity between, or hatred between the seed of woman and, and the serpent. The wicked have always opposed, always hated the godly. And when ungodly people oppose you, take heart. It means that you were probably actually doing something right. Besides, God will never take the side of evil. Therefore, realize then that it is your enemies, they will stumble and fall. That's what David knew. The third thing he knew was that God is bigger than any problem that we might face. David knew this was true no matter how large the threat. Look at verse 3. It says, Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war will rise against me, yet I will be confident. Some people can handle small problems, right? And there, there's people who handle some of the bigger problems pretty well all by themselves. But eventually, we all begin to reach a limit of what we can handle on our own. And when we hit that wall, when we reach that limit, well then, what then? David says, if God is your stronghold, it doesn't matter how great the problem gets. Now, I don't know many people who would be confident going up against an entire army all by themselves. I don't know very many people who would remain confident in that setting. If war broke out against them personally, individually, all of them against me alone. Those are pretty tough odds to beat. But you know what? Never play the odds when you're playing with God. David was confident in God no matter how great the threat that he faced. It doesn't matter how large a problem you're facing in your life. God is bigger than your problems. And you can have full confidence in Him. Now, that of course doesn't mean that everything's going to turn out the way that you want it to go, right? God in His wisdom may have a different plan for you than you would choose for yourself. Christians do suffer. We do grieve. We're not immune to sickness nor sorrow. Christians lose loved ones. We're imprisoned. Our our dreams sometimes don't come true. But God is faithful anyhow. And He will bring you through whatever troubles may come. In the long run, even death, death can't even hurt us. All death does is simply ushers us into the presence of God. The person who trusts God is never threatened by the odds. Know, know that God is greater than any problem you might face. So how did David do it? Why was David David able to pray with such confidence in the face of overwhelming odds. Verses 4 to 10 give us another part of David's secret. In in verses kind of 1 through 3, we see what David is talking about. He's he's praying for these things in his life of crisis, but in 4 through 10, we see him actually doing the praying. Praying for his life. Praying in a different way. David comes to God praying daily for strength in his life. How do we do this? Well, first, we have to come to God with a singleness of desire. Look at the beginning of verse 4. 
David says one thing, right? One thing have I asked of the Lord that I will seek after. Just one. One thing. One thing I have sought after the Lord for. What is that one thing for you? How would you finish that sentence? If you could only ask God for just one thing, what would it be? And we all remember the genie in the Bible, right? You rub it, you get three wishes. Now God appears before you and says, what do you want? Pick one thing, anything. What would you ask God for? What would be that that one thing you would ask Him for? When Solomon is given that opportunity, Solomon asks for, for wisdom to rule God's people. I think God loved that answer, right? But I think He liked David's answer even more. David's answer to that question is, that I might dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of my life to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and to inquire in His temple. This was the one thing that David wanted above all else. Whatever else might be, this is what he wanted. Other things he could do without, but not this. This was his non-negotiable. And I believe David was speaking from experience here. David wasn't just seeking something that he'd heard about, that he'd read about. He was passionate in this request. David, you see, had tasted and seen that the Lord is good, and now he's hungry for more. He wanted more of God. And nothing else would do. Everything else he might ask for would be a poor substitute. And David knew it. What is that one thing David desires? That he might dwell in the house of the Lord all of the days of his life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and an inquiring within his temple. When David's talking about dwelling in the house of the Lord, of course, he's not literally talking about, he wasn't like, I'm going to like make a bedroom at church, I'm going to stay there all the time, because that'll make me extra holy, right? Or in his case, it would have been the temple rather than the church, but you get the idea. Instead, he's talking about literally living in the presence of God, knowing God's presence daily in his life. Why did he desire to dwell in God's house all of his days? He gives us two reasons. If if he's able to dwell in the Lord's house, then he'd be able to gaze upon God's beauty and seek God in his temple. This is one of the neat experiences I had in seminary. Before I became a seminary student, I'd never really thought about God in the sense of beauty. Yes, I'd seen the beauty of creation, but I'd never really pondered God as beautiful himself. But he is, beyond imagination. Of course, God is spirit. We're not talking about some physical form of God. He has no outward form. But outward form is not necessary for beauty. Music can be beautiful. We can't see that, right? The beauty of music comes through orderly arranging of musical tones. God is a God of perfect order. And when we speak of God's beauty, we speak of His power, His character, His holiness, His faithfulness, His justice, His mercy, His kindness, His grace. A beautiful thing, all of those things in perfect harmony. Perfectly God. A God who thrills at being in relationship with you and me. God's beauty refers to His pleasantness, His delightfulness, His goodness, His graciousness. It talks about all kinds of wonderful character attributes. It inspires us then to deeper and greater love for Him. Delighting in God leads us into worship of God. To worship Him in spirit and in truth. Do you delight in God Do you seek the beauty of God? Do you truly enjoy Him? And if not, why not? Search His character, and you will find an ever-increasing beauty. I remember when I first studied this, as I said in seminary, the beauty of God, and I saw this whole new category of God that I had never approached before. And my eyes and heart were opened in new ways. 
And as we do that, we seek God in the same way that David was. This David who could call God as his light and his salvation. The same God, David said, was the strength of his life. And he said this because he spent his time gazing upon God's beautiful character. Fix your eyes upon him. Look to God frequently. Feast upon him. And enjoy sweet fellowship with him. David also says that he wants to see God in the temple, right? And the word seek here means inquire. David wants to gaze upon God's beauty and inquire of the Lord. Seeking his will, seeking God's guidance. Wanting to know God more. As Jeremiah says, Let him who boasts, boast about this, that he understands and knows me, declares the Lord. Why do we do the things we do? Why do we, why do we come to church on a Sunday, right? Do we come here to see others? Do we come here to be seen? Are we here just to listen to the music? Or maybe you're just here to listen to my message? Or are you actually coming seeking God to behold His beauty? To seek Him in His temple? Why does David seek God in this way? Look at verse 5. He says, For he will hide me in his shelter in the day of my trouble. He will conceal me under the cover of his tent, and he will lift me high upon a rock. David's confidence in God grew out of his worship, and his worship grew out of his confidence. You can see that cycle. David trusted that God would deliver him in this day of trouble. Now, we never know when the day of trouble is going to be coming for us. We never know what that day is going to hold for us. That's why the book of James warns against boasting about what might happen tomorrow. But that day of trouble, trial, temptation never comes as a surprise to God. We can always trust in Him. Now look at verse 6. It says, And now my head shall be lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I will offer in his tent sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and make melody to the Lord. Even before God has shown up, David is already planning a celebration party, right? It's like calling into the church saying, Hey, something tragic happened. I've got this prayer request. And then before you hang up, you go, Oh yeah, by the way, I also want to put in a praise that God has shown up somehow in some way to solve this problem. Put those both in the bulletin. Thanks. Bye. Right? Having that degree of confidence. Having that level of faith. Knowing as we lift up our prayer requests that we can also lift up the praises that God is going to answer and respond in some way. I once read about an amazing story about a Christian minister in China. And his name was uh, Wang Mingdao. And he spent 23 years in prison because of his faith. And it was his faith that inspired literally millions of Chinese Christians. And after he was released, after his 23 years in prison, um, he was released and he was meeting and talking with a minister from here in the United States. And, And this pastor from America said to him, I'll probably never be put into prison like you, so how can, how can your faith have any impact on mine? Pastor Wang replied, when you go back home, how many books do you have to read in your library for this coming month? How many letters do you have to write to people? How many people do you have to see? How many sermons do you have to preach? Pastor Wang said, you need to go back and build yourself a cell, cell, like a jail cell. He says, when I was put into jail, I was devastated. You see, I'm an evangelist. I wanted to hold crusades all across China. I was an author. I wanted to write books. I was a preacher. I wanted, I wanted to study and, and read the Bible and write sermons. But I had no Bible. I had no pulpit. I had no audience. I had no pen nor paper. I thought I could do nothing. But in that, I could do nothing except for getting to know God. And he said, and then for 20 years, I came to know that was the greatest relationship I could ever have. 
Wang went on to say, when I was pushed into a cell, I was transformed, but you will have to push yourself into one. Simplify your life so that you will have time to know God. Then the author ended his account of of his time with Pastor Wang by these piercing words. He said, revival can only come to those who make room for God. See, we need to be often in God's presence. We need to get to know Him in His Word and through prayer. We need to gaze upon God's beauty. That's the very thing that we were created for. It is ultimately what our hearts desire above all other things. If we come to God with a a singleness and desire, and if we apply our heart, if we seek God's face, That's what we see David doing here. Seeking God's face. Making that first in our lives. That's what we see in verse 7. Up until now, David's been talking about prayer. In verse 7, we see this transition where he begins to actually pray that. David says, Hear, O Lord, when I cry aloud and be gracious to me and answer me. David's main concern was that God would hear him. Not that, that, that others would hear his prayer. Not that he'd fulfilled his duty or his obligation. Just simply, Lord, hear my voice when I call. Be merciful to me and answer me. David's hope and assurance that God would answer him is based upon God's mercy. Once again, how did David know God's mercy? Because he had spent the time gazing upon God's beauty. When you know God, truly know God, your prayer life will then be transformed. And the more you know Him, the more you will love Him. The more you love Him, the more you will want to know Him. And this cycle begins to be part of this divine rhythm in your life. Beholding God's beauty, knowing God's love, loving and then knowing some more. And note David's deep humility in this. David was aware that he was coming before the living God and that he needed mercy. We need to, too, come humbly before God. Prayer is many things. It's communication. It's it's, it's relationship. It's request. But the central part of any definition of prayer is the concept of dependence. At the bottom line, when we are praying, we are depending upon the Lord. We are totally dependent upon God. But it takes humility for us to admit that. Some people's pride keep them from being willing to do that. But David instead calls upon God's mercy. And I love verse 8. Verse 8, David says, You have said, seek my face. My heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. You see, God speaks to our hearts and then our hearts speak back to us. God places a desire in each and every heart. A desire to be in relationship with Him. But sometimes we use other things trying to fill that. We try relationships. We try wealth. We try independence or whatever it is that we use. But everything else will fail if we try to substitute it in place of God in our lives. When your heart tells you to seek God in prayer, that's a moment of spiritual sensitivity. Don't turn away from it. Lean into it. And accept it. In that moment, God is trying to talk to you. David says, my heart says, seek his face. Your face, Lord, that I will seek. And then in verses 9 and 10, David goes on to recognize his own sin as he calls on God for help. And so he prays, Lord, hide not your face from me. Turn not your servant away in anger. O you have been my help. Cast me not off. Forsake me not, O God of my salvation. For my father and my mother have forsaken me. But the Lord, the Lord will take me in. Some people are rejected by their families, others by their mothers or their friends. But David says, even if my mother, even if my father, even if my family rejects me, God will receive me. 
And the word receive literally means to take care of. A very similar word to the word adopt. Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will adopt me. When those closest to you fail you, to whom will you turn? God says, I'm here, I will receive you. He will take you in. David is praying for that very thing. Not just praying for deliverance in time of crisis, he was, but he's also praying for daily strength and sustenance. And there's a third and final thing he's praying for. And he prays that he would persevere in prayer across his lifetime. We find that in verses 11 through 14. How do you pray? How do you persevere? How do you see it through for a lifetime? David says, Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witness has risen against me, and they breathe out violence. How often do you pray like this? How often do you pray, Teach me your way? Because I think more often than not, we end up praying, Give me my way, Lord, right? I want what I want. But David says, Lord, teach me your way. This is humility. Lord, I don't know the right way to go. Lord, you have set the path of my life. Lord, show me the way. You teach me. You guide me. Use me. Point me in the right direction, Lord. When we follow God's path for our life, we are safe and secure under His protection. When we leave God's path, we leave behind His protection and open ourselves needlessly to danger. And if we're going to persevere in prayer, we have to learn to see the goodness of God. David does this in 13 and 14. He says, I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord and be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait upon the Lord. David was confident that God would redeem him in this lifetime. He was willing to wait upon the Lord for that deliverance. David is talking about the long game here. He doesn't think necessarily that God will deliver him today, but at some point, God will. David trusts in the Lord. Then he encourages us as we go through trials, wait for the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Praying for your life can literally mean praying that you have to wait. Sometimes God's timeline is not the same as ours. But if we trust God, we know His timeline is perfect and pure. Wait upon the Lord and He will arrive on time. That's the confidence that David had. David was literally running for his life. Every day waking up not knowing if it was his last, if he would find an arrow through his heart, if somebody's going to stab him and kill him, if they were going to capture him and throw him in a jail cell till the day he died. Yet he said, Lord, you are my salvation, and I will wait for you. That is confidence, folks. That is the confidence that we should have as well. I challenge you to start praying in this way. Trusting that God will show up. Not knowing when or where or how, but knowing that He will. And then committing to pray in that way every day for the rest of your lives. Take heart and be strong. You will see God's goodness in the land. He promises. Wait for the Lord. Amen. Let's pray.